Welcome everyone to living a zero waste lifestyle in the time of COVID. This is the second webinar in a series being put on by Sustainable Resilient Longmont's Zero Waste Committee. Sustainable Resilient Longmont is a nonprofit organization that collaborates with the Longmont com community to cultivate a sustainable and thriving city through education, advocacy, and action. We have three main programs of focus. We put on the annual Longmont Earth Day celebration. We work to achieve 100% renewable energy by 2030 for the city of Longmont. And we advocate for the Longmont community to move towards becoming zero waste. My name is Naomi Kurland, and I'm the chair of the Zero Waste Committee for SRL, as well as the executive director of Longmont Food Rescue. Living a zero waste lifestyle is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And I am so excited to hear what our panelists have to share with us today. First, we'll be hearing from Rosie Briggs, the EcoLeaders Network Manager for EcoCycle, your local recycler for Boulder County. Rosie manages, trains, and coordinates and, pro pro coordinates and programs for over a thousand zero waste ambassadors or eco leaders across Boulder County and beyond, in addition to doing public outreach and community campaigns. When she's not answering waste questions, which she loves to do, she's lifting weights, hiking, or hanging out with her cat, Turtle. After Rosie, we'll hear from Jenny Kim, an obstetrician, gynecologist, physician, practicing in Longmont for 13 years. Her practice of mindfulness meditation guided her to becoming a teacher of mindfulness-based childbirth and parenting, or MBCP, a mindfulness-based program for expecting parents. She's been using the principles of both medicinal or medical, <laughs> of both medical and meditation practice, such as curiosity and observation to transform her way of living and being at home. Combined with her hobbies of crafting, organizing, and gardening, she brings ideas to transition the home to zero waste. And then we have the owners of Simply Bulk Market, Longmont's own zero waste bulk store. Devin and Heidi Quince have been lifelong advocates for leaving things better than, than they found them. In 2016, when the former owner was looking to retire, they purchased Simply Bulk Market after many years of shopping there in hopes of continuing the mission of zero waste. Since they took over, the store has grown with more and more people seeing the light and wanting to move to a more zero waste way of living. Welcome to all our panelists and our attendees. Before we get started, I wanted to mention that we have our Q&A open at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So if you'd like to ask a question of our panelists, please type it into the pop-up Q&A box and we'll have a time to discuss your questions after our panelist presentations. We're gonna start things off by learning about our waste streams and recycling efforts during COVID. So now I'll turn things over to Rosie Briggs. Great, thank you so much, Naomi. I'm so excited to be here. I'm a huge fan of Sustainable Resilient Longmont. Um, I love attending meetings. I am also a huge fan of Simply Bulk. Um, and I'm so excited to hear about all that Dr. Kim is doing now that I'm learning more about all of her tips and tricks. I'm really excited for her presentation as well. Um, so I am going to talk about the literal material aspect of zero waste here. Um, what you can, what you should put where. So I'm from EcoCycle and we are the Boulder County recyclers. So anytime you put anything into a bin around Boulder County, um, whether you're in a complex or a business or your home, it's going to come to our facility where we sort it out. Um, and so we make the guidelines and we can always answer your questions about what goes where. So um, I can answer any questions about what goes where if that comes up or if you want to email me later um, and I'll talk about that. But um, right now I'm just going to talk about kind of the most common um, questions that we're getting during COVID and some of the more relevant materials and, and where they go. Um, so although EcoCycle does work on um, a lot of advocacy and legislation and things like that for reducing, um, reusing, redesigning, things like that, um, I'm just going to be talking about downstream and Dr. Kim is going to talk a lot about reducing and all that good stuff. So I will go ahead and share my screen if I can. Um, wow. 
Every time I'm actually on camera, I panic and I forget where the present button is. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna start with a, a kind of an overview of where where we're at in recycling um, in in the face of COVID. So um, Naomi was brought up some really good questions about how have has our waste stream changed lately, um, if it if at all. And so we found that nationwide there's a 15 to 25 percent increase in residential recycling and waste. So it's not just recycling; it's just all of our stuff. We're just um, getting rid of more stuff in the home than ever, which makes sense because we're in the home more than ever. There's a general decline in commercial recycling and waste, but um, there's not really any hard numbers because it depends what's open and what's not, and it's hard to um, account for all the variables there. But also that makes sense. Um, locally, we're seeing an increase in recycling contamination. So in our um, Boulder County facility, we're seeing more contaminants than we usually do. Um, and that is due to a lot of um, people are doing kind of like spring cleaning and like cleaning out their garages or their basements and getting around to projects that they didn't have time for before um, and home renovations as well. So we're seeing just a lot more stuff, um, contaminations and otherwise. Um, we're also seeing a lot of PPE. So things like masks and gloves, um, you know, kind of our, our medical waste category of contaminants is increased as well. And I know that all of us have seen um, PPE lying around as litter. So not only in the recycling stream, but just kind of everywhere. Um, we're seeing a lot of single use items and more people are, which I'm sure um, the other two panelists will talk about, um, people are a little more scared of reusables and a little more prone to reach for a single use item because, you know, um, the health factor takes priority in this moment. So um, that's just kind of what we're seeing as the, in as the recycling industry right now. Um, so, Again, um, like I talked about, I'm only talking about the downstream side of things here um, and you know what goes where and what you can do with your to-go container and things like that. But just as, as a recycler, um, as EcoCycle, we, all, we are the first to say that we're not gonna recycle our way out of, this, um, out of this problem that we've created for ourselves. Recycling alone is not gonna um, solve, is not gonna be the solution. It's not the be all end all solution to our waste crisis. And so I just always like to, um, when I'm talking about what goes where, I always like to remind everyone that we have the zero waste hierarchy. Um, it's, you know, re reduce, reuse, recycle. Recycle should be our last one. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna start with shelf stable items. So this was more relevant. We talked about this a lot at the beginning of quarantine when everybody was storming the grocery stores and all the aisles were empty and people were just fighting over soup and things like that. So shelf stable items was one of the big ones um, in terms of COVID relevant waste. Um, so uh, on the left here, we have things that can be recycled. On the right, we can we have packaging that can't be recycled in your single stream. So I'll just go through them one by one. So cans, um, they're usually steel that hold things like um, soup, beans, tuna, that sort of thing. That's fine in the recycling. Um, steel and aluminum are both infinitely recyclable materials. So definitely recycle them, don't throw them out. Um, all containers, we just want to be empty like just give it a little rinse. You don't have to go nuts and scrub it and put it through the dishwasher, but we just don't want your tuna in the recycling. Um, labels are fine. Don't worry about labels or stickers. Um, the, just while we're on cans, the kind that you um, use a can opener on or peel off, I guess all of them really, except for like a soda can, um, that little top that's left, it's best if you can try to tuck it back in and pinch the top so that it stays. Um, because if not, it's going to get sorted with our papers and one of us are going to cut our hands on it. So just um, don't stress about it too much, but the more you can kind of tuck it back into its can friend and pinch the top, the better. Um, cartons is another one. This is one of the ones that most people don't um, know are recyclable, even though they are really widely recyclable at this point. So milk, juice, soup, coconut water, there's like protein shakes, um, all that good stuff. Um, that carton can be recycled. And even though it is a compound material, meaning um, there's a bunch of different materials all squished together into one, uh, and that usually means that we can't take it in the recycling. The carton industry takes responsibility for their own product. And so for that reason, we can recycle it here in Boulder County and Denver and a lot of other, most other kind of major cities at this point. You can keep the little cap screwed on um, to this carton. Things like pasta boxes or cereal boxes, all that stuff, the, those boxes are recyclable. If there's a little plastic window like you see here, that's fine. You don't have to worry about that. Um, and then jars, so like pasta sauce, for example. The lid, so the jar is glass, which is another infinitely recyclable and locally recyclable thing here in Boulder County. Um, uh, that's glass, so we want it, again, just to be like 
relatively clean. Don't worry about the sticker or the label, but that cap is going to be steel usually. So just go ahead and take it off and recycle it separately because we can't like grab it and try to unscrew the lid as it goes through our machine. But that lid is also recyclable. Um, we'll get it with a magnet, even if it has that kind of rubber seal on the inside, that's okay. Um, and then, so over here on the non-recyclable, um, or some of them are recyclable in some way, but non-single stream recyclable um, for shelf stable items. So bags for pasta and things like that. So this is like that crunchy bag. It's not stretchy. Um, it's made to kind of stand up like you see it there. Um, it's shiny, it's glossy. There's nothing really we can do with that. Um, that's just not recyclable. It's, we can't sort it and there's no one that will buy it. Um, wrappers, so like for bars um, or like a, like an Oreo box or something like that where it's just like a wrapper instead of a box. Um, those are also trash, same thing. Bread bags, these stretchy bags that hold things like bread or bagels. It's the same kind of bag as like a newspaper bag. Um, we don't want them in the recycling because when you put it in the regular single stream recycling, it will go through our machinery and there's all these rotating wheels and gears and it just jams it right up and we have to shut everything down and send somebody in there in the scary machine to try to drag out all those plastic bags. So it's not single stream recyclable, but it is hard to recycle material, uh, meaning that you can take it somewhere. It does have a market. It just has to be um, separately collected. So um, that number four bag, um, which again, it's just like a stretchy film or bag, you can take it to the Charm, you can take it to the Longmont Diversion Center. I'll talk about both of those in a minute. Um, most grocery stores have um, a collection for that and it gets turned into Trex decking. So that's the market for that guy. Um, and then these pouches, the ones that are, it has this bottom that's supposed to make it stay up. Um, so rice, granola, cookies, there's a lot of things, crackers that come in these pouches. Again, there's no market, it's um, a multi-layered material. So nobody will buy it and we can't sort it anyway. And then oatmeal and coffee containers, that's another one that has to go in the trash um, because like the carton, it's made of a bunch of different materials all kind of squished and glued together. And we can't, you know, take in our facility, take the aluminum from the cardboard from the plastic, you know, we can't rip it apart like that. Um, so if the, you know, oatmeal canister industry were to take responsibility for their product, it could hypothetically be recyclable, um, like we saw with the cartons, but so far that hasn't happened, so that's why it's a trash item for now. Um, I I don't know if questions are showing up. I can answer clarifying questions as I go, but I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, there's, there's a few questions specifically about what can and can't be recycled, so if you wanted to answer those. Um, about paper ream wrappers. Hmm, that is such a good one. That one is really tricky. The answer is no. Um, we actually like when I first was hired, we were trying to definitively figure that one out and it's we ran it under the sink and like scratched away at it and you can see that there's a plastic lining and um, the reason that the plastic ream or the, the paper ream wrapper has plastic in it is just like in shipping or whatever to protect the papers from any moisture or anything like that. So that wrapper actually has to be thrown away, but that's a really um, that's a really good extra credit one. Um, and then TerraCycle, I could talk about for a long time. Um, <laughs> uh, TerraCycle, there, so when I said like wrappers are unrecyclable, um, there are, there's kind of like special collection opportunities like t the company TerraCycle. And I think a lot of the stuff that TerraCycle does is awesome. Like Loop, um, they're involved with Loop and they're, they're you know, it's, um, it's the Milkman model where you can get your haagen in a, um, in a steel container and then send it back, which is awesome. That's circular economy. That's what we advocate for all the time. Um, but when they take things like um, candy wrappers and bar wrappers and things like that, uh, basically what they're doing is creating their own market for it. So because they charge for those collection boxes, um, that's, they're just essentially creating their own um, market. And then they turn it into stuff like, uh, you know, nobody's going to buy it from them to turn it into so, you know, a new wrapper or anything. Um, so for the most part, they're going to be making it into, into stuff like, uh, you know, a bench or, you know, just kind of things that they can melt it down into. And so there's just like, it's cool that, you know, you're saving a bench, a bench sized portion of landfill space. Uh, but there's only so many benches you can do. And it kind of tends to, um, for people that are already really good at, at being zero waste. And there's like, they're like, I just have this one thing left that can be a good solution. But for a lot of people, um, you know, they'll be like, buy a zero waste box and throw all your waste into this one box and then ship it to us. And we'll, we'll recycle everything when really it's, you know, it's 
it, it should be a little more comprehensive than that. Um, Rosie, I'm going to jump in. I think we're getting a lot of questions about what can and can't be recycled. So I think maybe why don't you go through the rest of your presentation because you might answer some of those questions. And then at the end, we can do some rapid fire if you haven't touched on it yet. Yes. Yeah. The TerraCycle one is not a quick answer. It's mixed basically from our perspective as a recycler, but I can, I can send out an email about that to the, whoever is wondering. Um, okay. So yes, that was just shelf stable. I'm going to talk about more. Um, so frozen food packages. Uh, the thing with frozen food is that if you are designing your product to live in the freezer, you're probably designing it to, um, to kind of fend off freezer burn, uh, which renders a lot of things unrecyclable. So ice cream cartons, um, like that oatmeal canister, it's just made of a bunch of different stuff all squished together. We just can't take it. There's no, we can't buy or we can't sell it to anybody. Frozen food boxes is a really tricky one because although it looks like something like a pasta box or a, uh, a cereal box, um, because it's designed to live in the freezer, it has this added kind of spray on layer that you can't necessarily feel or see. Um, and again, it's to prevent freezer burn. Um, so even if that product inside is wrapped in something, um, you know, like shrink wrapped in something or has a plastic wrapper, that box is designed to, to kind of fend off freezer burn. Um, so um, I, I'm just realizing that I put an Amy's in there, which is funny because Amy's is one of the only um, companies who actually came to us, came to EcoCycle and said, I hear that they're not recyclable. Um, what can we do about that? And so then we helped them redesign their box so that it doesn't have that freezer burn lining. But the thing is that um, we can't sort for brands. So we have all of our employees like standing on, um, standing in our facility. There's all these conveyor belts whizzing um, by in front of them. They have all this material on them and they have to work so fast to grab stuff. And they're looking for contaminants to grab off. So they're looking for frozen food boxes to go yoink and throw it away. Um, and so they can't take time to be like, oh, never mind, it's Amy's. Nobody touch it, it's Amy's. So um, that, while that's a great thing for Amy's to have done, um, we can't say it's recyclable until the whole industry does it. Um, so that's a good way to lead the industry, but we need the whole industry to do it. Frozen treat wrappers, so like a popsicle or a um, whatever it is, ice cream sandwich, whatever it is, that's like like the candy wrapper. It's unrecyclable. And then this frozen barrier vegetable bag, if it's stretchy, it can go to that hard to recycle stretchy plastic bag collection. Um, and if it's like, again, that kind of shiny, like crinkly one, um, then that just has to go in the trash. And if it is um, kind of a berry bag that's stretchy, before you throw it in the hard to recycle collection, make sure it's not like all covered in juice and stuff like that. Um, okay, and then to-go containers <laughs> became more relevant later on in quarantine. We have like our different phases of quarantine that showed up in different ways in our waste, which is interesting. So um, over here we have the recyclable ones. Um, so hard plastic takeout containers, whether it's kind of black or like this clamshell, so whether it hinges the top or not, or the top fully comes off, both of those are fine. Black plastic is an ideal, but we can still take it as long as it's that hard plastic. Um, the exceptions to those are if it's um, specifically compostable, which I will talk about compostables um, in a moment. So we don't, we can't recycle the corn plastics. Um, we want that to go in the compost instead, and then we don't want styrofoam. So it's called polystyrene. Most people know it as styrofoam, but um, that crunchy, gross, styrofoamy stuff that we can't take. Um, so cardboard pizza boxes. So there is more like a, a plasticky pizza box that you see sometimes if you get like a single slice. We don't want that guy because um, again, it's plastic line, but um, this just a regular old pizza box. Um, that kind, if it's kind of clean, if it doesn't have cheese and oil and grease all over it, um, we can take it in the recycling. If it is soiled, we can take it in the compost. So what I do a lot of times is like rip off the top and recycle it and then compost the bottom. Um, paper bags. So there's a lot of like food delivery going on and they will hand it to you in a paper bag. Um, that's fine in the recycling. And then aluminum. So if you get like Chipotle or something like that, they have this aluminum bowl on the bottom um, and that can be recycled again as long as it's clean. And if it has that plastic lid on the top, that plastic lid can go in as well. Just make sure they're separated. Um, and then aluminum also comes up as like a burrito wrapper or something like that. So if it is clean, like just try to, you know, scrape off the cheese, like rinse it off if you can. Um, we can take that in the form of a ball and we want that ball to be two inches in diameter at least. So um, <laughs> it sounds like really specific guidelines, but it's just because if it's flat, then our machines will think it's paper. It'll sort it with paper. 
And um, if it's a ball that's smaller than two inches, it'll fall through the cracks in our machine and we won't be able to get it out. So we just want it to be like, it can be a loose ball. We just want it to be like a three dimensional thing. Um, and so then our no-nos for takeout, we have styrofoam, which I talked about. It's called polystyrene, but we all know it as styrofoam, which just shouldn't exist. We should just not buy it or make anything out of it. Avoid it at all costs. That's a really bad one. Um, condiment cups, this is an interesting one. They're almost, even though they feel like hard plastic, they're almost always made of polystyrene, that number six plastic, um, which is that like really crunchy, like you, you, you know it when it turns up as styrofoam, but that same plastic, that number six polystyrene can also show up in a denser form that you wouldn't recognize as styrofoam, but it's equally toxic and unmarketable. Like a solo cup is a, is a number six polystyrene. So this, these condiment cups are on, they're really small and crunchy and they'll like break into a million pieces. They're also like all oily, but that number six means that we really can't market it. So again, unless it's compostable, we really don't uh, want that guy. And if it's compostable, we still don't want it in the recycling, we want it in the compost. Plastic cutlery, um, this is a big one. We get a lot of this in the recycling. So even though this is made of the same plastic usually as like a yogurt tub, um, in this form, whether it's black or white or clear or whatever it is, um, it's super crunchy. Um, it's really small. Nobody will buy it because of that. Um, and it'll usually like just fall through the cracks and get all broken up in our machine anyway. So we can't take pasta cutlery. Again, there's usually compostable versions. Um, but yeah, like bring your own, you know, use your own, like, especially if you're getting takeout, I'm always like, don't give me the plastic cutlery. Like I am in my own house where I obviously have forks. So, you know, if you're going on a picnic or even like going to pick up food, like just bring your own stuff. Um, plastic to go bags. So um, again, this is the same kind of rule that if it's really stretchy, if you were to, if you were to rip it and it rips in a ripple pattern, um, that's the kind that we can take in the stretchy plastic bag collection. But if it's like the shiny, like stand up on its own bag, then that just has to go in the trash. Plastic coated paper is one of our all time biggest contaminants ever. So it can look like the soup container, it can look like a coffee cup, it can look like a Chinese food takeout box. Um, all of that stuff is just like, it looks like paper, but it has this big old plastic lining in it because paper does not do a good job of holding your hot soup or coffee. So because of that plastic lining, we can't recycle it. Um, again, there's like some compostable alternatives to this guy, but we don't want any of these in the recycling. Um, so yeah, I have my coffee to go here as well. Um, and then plastic cups is a really hard one because even though plastic cups look and feel a lot like um, something, you know, like a to-go container, um, plastic cups show up in every number imaginable, any, every different type of plastic. There's just like no consistency in what they make into a cup. So we never know what we're going to get. But also um, there's just way too much contamination associated with plastic cups. So if we say like, we'll take plastic cups, then we get the styrofoam one and the coffee one and the um, the compostable one and then the like half of the numbers we can't um, market and plus we get the coffee and we get the smoothie and the ice and the straw and all that stuff. So we just don't do plastic cups unless it's that really rigid like big gulp. It's called a souvenir cup. It's like you can knock on it, you can squish it, it won't break. Um, that really rigid like durable one we can take and it will usually have a two or a five on the bottom. And I know that it's super confusing. Like I, if I were a beginner to recycling or even not a beginner and I was watching this, I'd be like, how am I supposed to remember all of this stuff? Um, but especially with cups in the plastic industry, we're like, we get it. Like we hate it too. And we wish that there were, wasn't so much plastic to keep track of. Like we don't want to deal with plastics, but um, that's how it's cranked out. So we have to be detailed when we talk about it. Um, and then straws is the last one. Straws are just too small and flimsy and nobody will buy them. So we can't do straws. Um, and then PPE, that's a big no thank you. So um, the recycling, one of the biggest impacts for the recycling world um, is just kind of like health and safety for our employees in our industry. So not only like it's an essential service, we have to keep going, but we also have to staff our um, our facility because we can't we can't just not run it by people. We have to run it by people so that they can throw it um, So they can sort it. So like, you know, we have to hand sort papers We have to hand sort cartons for example, and we also have to use um, Hand sorters to get out contaminants So we have to employ these people But we have to keep them safe and try to keep them distance and try to figure out how to bring them into work But also if you're giving us stuff like masks then we don't want them to come in contact with those masks so please be extra careful with your medical waste which we never want but like definitely 
be mindful that we have real people in this facility before you throw away your syringe or your mask or whatever it is. Um, and then compostables. So like I said, there's a lot of compostable versions of um, a lot of the products that I mentioned, especially the to-go containers, um, the to-go stuff in general, the takeout stuff. So rather than kind of list them all, I'm just going to show how you tell whether it's, whether it's compostable or not. So with recycling, because facilities and markets change from place to place, um, there's no universal set of guidelines. So you just have to kind of reach out to your local recycler, learn what your, what your local guidelines are and go from there. You can't really look at the bottom of it or look at the product itself to tell if it's recyclable. But with compost, it's a lot easier. Um, so you can see up here, these are the uncoated ones, um, like that pizza box that I said, it's just regular cardboard. Um, with the kind of uncoated um, clamshell and plate, it's just, um, you know, you can feel it. It feels like an egg carton. It's rough. There's no shiny lining on it. Um, these guys are plastic coated and they have to go in the trash. And then um, things that look like um, <laughs> that look like their trash counterpart but are compostable, you can tell if they're compostable because of all this labeling. So there is um, a certification for compostability. It's called BPI certified. So um, BPI certifies whether these things can go in the industrial compost, so not necessarily your backyard. But here in Boulder County, we are lucky to have access to industrial compost. Um, we have A1 Organics, which is our facility, and we're building a local county facility in the next few years. Um, so BPI will say, like it'll say BPI certified, it'll say certified compostable, it'll have all of this kind of the symbol, the logo, um, and all of that will tell you that it's actually compostable. If it says something like biodegradable or made from plants or something, that's no good. That's usually greenwashing. So um, whether it is, um, you know, something that looks like a plastic clamshell or um, a, a compostable coffee cup, um, anything like that, even like utensils, you want to look for BPI certified or even certified compostable is fine. Um, and then you want to look for all of this kind of labeling. Usually they do a pretty good job. You can see on this like plastic cup, they do a pretty good job of, um, of labeling in a big way that it's compostable because they had to get certified to do that. Um, so it's, it's usually just made of corn plastic. Um, so it's not petroleum and that's the difference. And we, we don't want it in the recycling because we can't recycle corn, but we can take it in the curbside composting. Um, and just again, like I, my little um, spiel at the very beginning of this with these products, like, you know, if this is actually going to the compost rather than the trash, you know, this corn plastic cup in the compost is better than like a solo cup in the trash, but it's still a single use product. Um, it's still linear. Anything you use for like two seconds and then throw somewhere doesn't make sense. So anytime, even, you know, if you have the option to have compostables, anytime you can use reusables or just reduce them all together, avoid them all together is the way to go. Um, and then other resources. So I mentioned the charm to take your plastic bags. Um, there's a bunch of stuff you can take there, like scrap metal, block styrofoam, um, your toilet, whatever, um, <laughs> all of that. So that's the EcoCycle Charm, the Center for Hard to Recycle Materials. That's at 6400 Arapahoe in Boulder. Um, it's right across from the old power plant on Arapaho. Um, and then we have the law in Longmont, we have the Waste Diversion Center, which is a great um, resource for Longmont residents. Um, and that's at 140 Martin Street. Um, and it doesn't have as much as the charm, but you can bring a lot of stuff there. And then the EcoCycle A to Z app, it's just if you type in EcoCycle A to Z wherever you get your apps, um, it will come up. It's like a blue recycling symbol. And you can literally just type in whatever you want and we'll tell you where to take it. So whether it's like put it in the curbside recycling or the compost or bring it to Charm or send it to this address, um, we will tell you what to do with it. Um, you can be like yoga mat. I mean, you just weird things. So um, you can do that. You can also call us. We have full-time people just answering the phones. Uh, and you can email me too because I also write a, a, um, a recycling advice column in the Longmont Times call. It's called Dear TC and it's a little green monkey and that's me. So anytime, especially from Longmont residents, um, I love to personally field um, recycling questions. So you just, you can send me like a, a little question or like send me a picture of something and I'll tell you where it goes and maybe put it in <laughs> the Times call. Um, so those are, yeah, if you're ever, um, if you ever have questions, which I know all of us do all the time, you can use any of those resources. And that's all my slides.
Great. Thank you so much, Rosie. Um, it's incredibly helpful to learn what we can and cannot recycle. And clearly there's a lot of interest in learning more. Um, I would advise people to check out that app and also message Rosie directly. I'd love to go through some of the questions, but I want to make sure every panelist gets some chance to uh, share their presentations. So up next, Jenny Kim is going to share a wealth of knowledge and ideas about how to make your home zero waste. Okay, I think I successfully unmuted myself and um, let me get into I'm really delighted. It's such a privilege for me to be speaking to all of you today. Um, this is not a professional topic for me at all. I'm not an expert on zero waste, but I am a Longmont resident and I think the composting program, the curbside composting program, when it first rolled out in 2017. So ever since that happened, I've been interested in figuring out how to fill up my compost bin and how to reduce the trash that leaves the house. And it's, it's been a process. At first, the bin, the compost bin wouldn't fill up much at all. But now that is my most full bin. Um, and the trash is maybe a third of the way filled, if even that. So I'm really proud of that. And, um, and you know, maybe it'll get to being even less if we follow some more of these measures. So thank you, Rosie, for giving me some additional tips um, on some things that I was still confused about. It's always great to revisit it every time. Um, about two years ago, I had to uh, come home from work and have hip surgeries, and so, I was literally forced to stop what I was doing and stay home. And, you know, it wasn't a great reason to be at home, but looking around me, there were so many blessings and so many things that I had always wanted to do. Um, so I took advantage of that time. And um, for all of us, it's never a great time to be in a pandemic, but here we are, safer to be at home. It's not a punishment. Um, we can actually accept this gift of being present in our homes, waking up to how we live, noticing everything around us, what's wonderful and what might be even more wonderful. And there's really no one way to get to reducing waste or getting to zero waste. Every home is different. Um, everyone's lifestyles are differently. So see what needs to happen in your home. Um, I did what worked for us in our home, um, just one change at a time, because otherwise it would have just been too overwhelming. And um, as I looked to prepare this talk, I found that the, the, the path to zero waste includes reducing, reusing, recycling, and composting. And so that's how I've um, created these slides. So we're doing a lot of great things already. So many people um, in our area are not using the plastic grocery bags. We're uh, using the readily available grocery bags. And if you're inclined to and you're crafty and you want to learn how to sew, you can make your own or you can upcycle bags that you already have. And we're not, I started subscribing to CSAs a few years ago. And um, by doing that, we um, support the farm by paying in advance in winter time and every week from late spring summer to early fall we get a weekly share of vegetables and um, and they're delicious and they're fresh and um, you learn how to make new foods and you're forced to cook and um, and it's just been a beautiful way for me to um, feel better about what i'm eating and it's much cheaper to do it that way than to buy things individually. Okay, next slide. Cooking at home, I can't say enough about it. It's really just a true source of joy in our home. I think everyone's at a different place with cooking, but um, see what you can do. Take advantage of all the great recipes and blogs online, um, any ingredients that you have um, and wanna prepare, it's, it's so great to do. Um, next one. And if you're cooking at mo cooking more, you'll need a system to store your food. So um, in our house, um, 
we have designated a whole drawer full of plastic, not plastic, they're glass containers, and they're great for storing leftovers, um, for storing and portioning out bulk foods. If you've made a big pot of soup, um, you can portion it out for leftovers in the freezer or the fridge if you've made yogurt or a big batch of beans. Um, and then also the lower picture is um, a way to design space in your home, in your pantry, shelves, wherever you have, collect um, containers for bulk foods like flour, rice, um, granola, snacks, beans, whatever you use on a regular basis, um, shop at bulk market and um, fill up those containers. Next slide. Um, so here is a picture of some containers that um, have a lot of household products. And um, if, you, if you press next again, I think um, more things will show up. Um, you know, I've had the wish to make my own um, lotions and cleaning solutions, sometimes bath bombs or laundry detergent. So, Think about whether there's anything you want to make on your own so that it can be more environmentally friendly and produced with fewer chemicals, safer for you. And on the next slide is um, a really successful thing in our house. I made um, laundry detergent well over a year ago and it's lasted a whole year. I'm really so thankful for the people um, that create these blogs and, and do a great amount of research um, and put a little lot of work and effort and heart into their um, into their um, homemade recipes and share them but um, but my even my kids who do their own laundry use the same laundry detergent so it's um, it's lasted a whole year for a family of five and then using dryer balls is much uh, more environmentally friendly and um, safer for respiratory conditions um, than um, using the traditional dryer sheets. Okay, next slide. And this slide has us really thinking about um, what we're buying. You know, I, I think um, Rosie had mentioned that at home um, garbage disposal has gone up during COVID and that's because we're all clearing out our houses. And so we know that we've all bought a lot of things, we've acquired a lot of things over the years. And when we look around, we wonder, wow, do, you know, do I really need this stuff? What do I really need? What is useful for me right now? And as we um, reduce what we have in our homes, we really wanna think about uh, where to send it. You know, can we pass it on to someone else who needs it? Can we, um, um, sell it on Craigslist? Can we check EcoCycle and Charm to see what's the proper way of disposing it? Can we uh, donate it to thrift stores? Um, and same goes with buying new things. Um, if we do need anything new in our house, do we really need to buy it new? Um, what about considering a used option? And, you know, lately even my teenage daughters want to shop at thrift stores, <laughs> so they've um, been a really good influence on me. Um, and thrifting is just so much better for our wallet and better for our planet. And as we transition into the next slide, um, which um, these are things I've made from, from old clothes, I just want to mention, and you know, I think I've always known um, that the textile and fabric production has an extremely high environmental cost, but I didn't know until preparing this talk how high that was. So a pair of jeans, a single pair of jeans takes 1,800 gallons of water to make. Wow, <laughs> right? That's a lot of water. Um, and generates greenhouse gases that are equivalent to driving 80 miles. So, so this is significant. Um, so really, um, thrifting is important because if we just throw away the clothes, they'll sit in the landfill for hundreds of years. And by thrifting, we can, um, we can really keep the resources that were invested in, in making these products. And if um, you have old sheets or clothing that just feel like you can't um, 
pass them on. You can cut them up and make fabric scraps. And again, tons of tutorials on YouTube to make them. Um, the picture on the right is um, a rug that I made from all the kids' um, elementary school t-shirts, turkey trots and such. Um, in the middle is a uh, rug that I made from old sweaters. And then on the left is a rug that I'm in the process of making from old sheets. So, um, so don't throw fabrics away. And um, next slide is um, plastic bags. So Rosie did a really nice job of explaining what types of plastics are, um, are um, recyclable, what plastics go in the special recycle. Um, and so we've designated a bin in our pantry to save bags that just, you know, might otherwise be thrown away or we wouldn't know what to do with them. And the paper bags are great for ripening fruit and the plastic bags are great for um, marinating vegetables or meats or for preserving herbs in the refrigerator. Next slide is um, another use for um, plastic cups um, that we might otherwise throw away. They make great greenhouses for plants. Um, plants are such a beautiful way to decorate our home and um, they give us clean air. Um, it, it, you know, it's a great place to put our attention and our curiosity and watch them grow. So here I took a cutting from a friend's plant, let it grow roots, and I've planted it in soil in a Freddy's cup, <laughs> this looks like, and then I'm gonna put it in a, a tea tin for, um, to make it look nice. Okay, next slide. Um, more crafts, if you're interested um, in sewing or purchasing someone's um, craftiness, reusable napkins. Um, the white bag is upcycled from a pillowcase. So pillowcases can be reused. Um, these um, uh, curtains uh, are made from fabric bought at thrift stores and um, the round circular um, little wipes are makeup wipes. So instead of throwaway makeup wipes, um, my daughter uses these recycled, um, reusable ones. And next, um, slide has um, dish scrubbies because, um, you know, being at home, there's more, more cleanup, you know, everyone's running their dishwasher more, everyone's washing more dishes, and we have to find peace with, um, with the cleanup. So I um, crocheted some scrubbies many years ago, and they've served me well, but I find that you can also save um, the, the mesh bags from lemons or oranges or onions, potatoes, anything you've bought that has this mesh plastic, you could just um, roll it up into a ball and use it for scrubbing dirty dishes and getting the oil off of the skillets. And on the next slide are additional ideas. Um, you know, since we're composting, the stuff that goes in our trash is a little less dirty. So <laughs> thank you for, um, for looking here at my trash bins. Um, uh, I took t-shirts and just cut off the, um, the arms to make these really simple bags. If you want to add elastic, um, you can find elastic from old pants or boxer shorts or anything like that. And even for the kitchen, um, trash bag and recycle bin, um, I found that um, old shower curtain liners or just shower curtain fabric is nice way to upcycle that. Um, on the next slide uh, is the project that I'm currently working on. Uh, these are produce bags. Um, instead of using plastic to purchase fruits and vegetables, um, would it be possible to transition to something reusable? Um, so you can see the middle picture has S SRL on it and I've made these to give as gifts for anyone who signs up um, as a new SRO member. So be sure to sign up and hopefully you'll get some bags while the supplies last. Okay, so we've done a lot of reusing 
And now we're going to recycle. But since um, Rosie said um, plastic is still um, somewhat hard to recycle, think about, um, you know, look at your trash, see what's in it. And in my case, um, we eat a lot of tofu and these white tofu containers um, were filling up the recycle. And I thought, well, let me just start saving them. And then I put them into drawers as organizers and they make fantastic drawer organizers for the garage, for the craft room or anywhere you could use them. So look around your home, see what you have piling up. And on the next slide, I have um, a few more things um, that I can think about what I might do with. And now moving on to the next slide for composting. Um, you know, we all know that food scraps are recyclable, but you can also save your um, vegetable scraps, the, even the, um, the onion and the outside of the onion, um, the tops of the carrots, anything that you would normally um, throw away, put it in a bin airtight bin in the refrigerator and maybe once a week or so make some vegetable broth. And if you're a meat eater and you have bones, um, make, um, make a meat broth. Um, and of course you can save it in the fridge and if you wanna freeze it, um, we found that making these pucks by freezing them in upcycled um, containers um, makes a great way of, of defrosting them more easily so that they're more user friendly when you're ready to to prepare the next meal. And this last slide is about um, composting, which you know results in a lot of beauty in our world if we learn how to do it. But um, composting in the beginning when you get your bin, it's pretty stinky. Um, <laughs> when food is wet, um, it, you know, it makes your kitchen counter or under the kitchen sink collection pretty messy and so it was really a blessing for me when I discovered um, these uh, liners. So if we um, go off of um, screen share, um, back to me, oh gosh. We're off screen share now, you can, you can, uh, as long as you're talking I think it'll feature you. Okay. I, I don't have a picture of myself and I need to, um, I need to see that I'm sharing it properly. Um, I don't know if I am or not. Can you see this bag? Yep. Okay. I can't see myself, but I'm going to do the best I can. So we're making this, um, bag out of newspaper. So, um, a uh, circular from King Supers or Safeway, you'll get a, a square sheet of paper. And if you fold it in half into a triangle, there's going to be an origami tutorial in the links where you can watch this again. Make it into a triangle, take one corner and fold it um, to the middle and take the other corner and also bring it to the middle. So now you've got the top of your container and, and then we'll just fold the flaps over. And by doing that, we've made a really quick um, bag to catch all of the wetness. And if you throw away your compost every one to three days, it'll be far less stinky. <laughs> and um, it just makes it more manageable to do that. Oh, wonderful, Jenny. Thank you. Yeah, that all showed up perfectly. We could see. So sorry, you can't see yourself right now. But I love all of these creative, inventive ideas you have. They're really inspiring. 
Um, I had just thrown out some lemon bags from a food, food rescue shift I had done this weekend. And so when I was reviewing your slides in advance, I got a sneak peek of them. I like, I pulled all these out of the trash and I put one of these together based on your, uh, your picture. And it took like less than five minutes. It was so fast and easy. So thank you so much for sharing that tip. Awesome, thank you. I'm so glad to be here. So Jenny provided us with a wide array of links that are in the uh, Zoom webinar chat. And we'll also be sharing all these links um, to our Facebook and our YouTube video descriptions after the webinar is done. And if you have additional questions for Jenny, you can type them into the Q&A box. And we're going to hopefully get to some questions at the end. And if not, we are also um, live answering questions in the chat. So now that we've learned how to make our homes zero waste, we're going to hear about how to stock our homes with okay. zero waste goods with Devin and Heidi Quince of Simply Bulk Market. All right. Hello, everyone. Everyone hear me okay? Okay. So my wife and I own Simply Bulk Market on 418 Main Street downtown. Hopefully everyone has been there. Um, if not, we're there. Um, so we're just going to talk a little bit about zero waste and COVID-19, steps for zero waste shopping during the pandemic. And of course, it's not going to work. Okay, so um, one thing that we've noticed and that honestly is really frustrating is that everyone, not everyone, but I will say society has seemed to have kind of thrown their environmental beliefs, values kind of out the window um, in a, I don't know if it's a panic mode, but um, there's no need to do that. Um, especially with everything going on, we need to reduce our plastics and single use production more than ever. There's no need to replace washable bags, containers, et cetera, with single use options. Um, especially right now, there's a shortage of new containers. So we need to upcycle, upcycle, upcycle. Um, our store does sell new uh, containers and we're having a hard time getting those in. So, um, you know, reuse, reuse, reuse. There's, there's such a huge surplus of existing can containers out there, both glass and plastic. And so we need to redo, reuse what we have in the system now, kind of back to that circular economy. Um, and, you know, most folks, they have an abundance of ready to use containers in their pantries and recycling bins that are ready to clean and go. Um, I mean, like both Jenny and Rosie said, take a look at what's in there, wash them. You've, you know, you've got things that you could fill hundreds if not thousands of times, especially when you look at things like laundry containers. There's such a, you know, high density plastic that you could, you could drop a rock on them and they're still gonna work. Um, you know, and especially, you know, with normal sanitizing procedures, there's no evidence of the virus staying on bags or in dry containers. You know, as always, washing hands is the best way to be safe. Also, shopping in bulk can reduce how often one has to shop if that's a concern having to go out, I don't know, every week. One thing we've seen at the store is we, a lot of our customers used to come in, say once a week and buy smaller amounts. Now they're coming in every two weeks or every month and buying larger amounts so that they're not having to be out as often. Um, we also offer curbside options for zero waste shopping, which, you know, also means you can bring your containers to us, drop them off, we'll fill them, we'll let you know when they're ready to go, and you can come pick them up outside, we'll bring, you know, we'll bring a terminal out for you to pay with a card. Um, we also have local in-season produce from farmers. We are partnering with places like Olin Farms, Buckner Ranch, Mini Moose, and Highland Honey. And just a few quick pictures of, for people who may not have may not have been in the store. Um, you know, we have bins of nuts and grains and you know flowers, rices, quinoa. Um, you know, the um, locally made soaps and lotions, personal care items, um, you know, cereals, grains, and uh, probably the largest selection of bulk spices and oils, sweeteners that you can find pretty much anywhere. So that was pretty much my presentation. And we also have cleaning supplies, personal care items, um, you know, laundry detergents, dishwashers, um, just, I mean, pretty much if we can carry it in bulk, we have it. 
No. Great. Well, I have a I have a quick follow up question for you, Devin, and maybe also for Jenny. Um, so you mentioned some of the liquid home care products you have that are easy to refill in bulk, like you know dish detergent and stuff. What options would you recommend for items that typically come in difficult to recycle packaging, like toothpaste and deodorant? Um, well, we 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 sell tooth powders, so you can bring in your you know your uh, glass or I mean I hate to say plastic, but if you've got a, you know little plastic yogurt containers around the house bring them in, reuse them, you know, 10, 20, 30 times, and you could make tooth powder out of those. We carry a um, bulk spray deodorant that you can bring in and, you know, fill a spray bottle, whether it's glass or plastic up, that you could use that. So, um, so yeah, I mean, um, toothpaste, we haven't found a bulk way to do toothpaste yet, so we push people to the tooth powders. Okay, great. Jenny, have you ever branched out and tried doing a deodorant or a toothpaste in your crafting? I haven't done toothpaste. Um, there are deodorant recipes out there, but I'd probably try Devon's at the bulk market first. <laughs> before yeah, that spray sounds great. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Devon, for all you do for providing sustainable shopping solutions for our Longmont community. And so if um, our Zoom attendees have additional questions, you can keep leaving those in the Q&A and we're gonna open up some, uh, some Q&A right now. So this one is for Rosie. Once the materials, uh, uh, when, once the, uh, the materials are packaged and, and you know, sorted and compiled, where do Boulder County's recyclables go? Yeah, um, so it's not just one answer because every material has its own market. So um, we get the China question a lot. We have since 2018 when um, the China policy happened and it hit the, the news outlets. Um, so we do not sell our materials to China and we never have. But um, so we keep everything just as local as we possibly can. That's always been our, um, our objective from the beginning. Um, and it's worked pretty well in the face of policies like China. So um, paper in general goes to kind of Pacific Northwest area. The reason that we don't have a local paper mill is just because we don't have um, water here in Colorado. So <laughs> that makes it hard. Um, uh, plastics, they just get sent all over and it's a moving market. So it's just kind of like, who wants this? And then they bid on it sort of thing. You know, it's, it's fluid like any kind of big market, um, but there's kind of hubs in like the Carolinas area. Um, glass and aluminum are both, or well, glass uh, and steel are both local. Um, steel is in Colorado and then glass is, is very local. We worked very hard to get a, a local closed loop on glass. It just goes to Broomfield and then there's two local bottling companies as well. Um, so your stuff, your glass really isn't going further than Broomfield and it can be back on the shelves within a couple weeks. Um, and the reason that we work so hard specifically with glass is because it's so heavy that if we have to ship it all the way to Utah, which is where the, the closest market was previously, it kind of undoes what you're trying to do by recycling glass. Um, and then aluminum is in our, um, in the kind of four corners area. So it's local, but it's not, it's local, um, but it's not within Colorado. And again, like they move around, but um, those are kind of the general <laughs> ones. And uh, we had another question about why some places shut down curbside composting during the pandemic. Do you know why that might be? Um, I know that for, um, so we haul, EcoCycle hauls composting as well. And I know that, that we did have to do some, com some communications around things like tissues just to protect our folks. So if our, you know, our truck drivers and things like that are having to literally handle your garbage, which they do, um, and you have a confirmed case in your house and you threw a bunch of tissues in the compost, um, then I know that was a, a factor we didn't shut down. Um, I think just in general, just the handling of it. I don't. <laughs> I yeah. Don't Possibly non-compliance too. It sounds like from uh, from people if if they're home a lot more, potentially. Um, all right. Well, this question is for any of the panelists to answer. How would you respond to someone who says plastic and plastic waste? is just an inevitable part of modern life. I, I, would, I would say that that's sad. Um, I mean, it, while when it was first created, it, it was an amazing product, but I, 
I think, you know, for, for things like medical equipment, stuff like that, it works really well, but I think we've gotten too used to it and we need to just reduce our use of it. Um, you know, particularly, you know, stop making stuff that's single use. Um, if, if you are gonna make something out of plastic, either make it recyclable or make it, you know, like, um, you know, as much as I hate to talk about the Costco two or three gallon laundry detergents, um, going back to how durable those are, you buy one of those and then go find a shop like ours where you can fill it a hundred, a thousand times. We have some customers who they've, they've said they're still using the same container for 10 years. As long as our store has been open, they're still filling the same container. So, I but think that's just my, <laughs> my soapbox. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, uh, well, we, EcoCycle just um, screened the story of plastic and I know that SRL was looking to that as well, um, or maybe did it. Yeah, we have the screening open. I'm, I'll share some links at the end. Uh, so people who still want to watch it, there's another um, few days I, I left on that. That's a great one to watch for this, to answer this question. Um, I just watched it again. It's not fun to watch, but um, it's, it's a lot of it is. It's about how um, it's, we didn't start using this amount of plastic out of necessity it was, it's like forced down our throats. So, you know, plastic, the plastic industry is the oil and gas industry. Um, and like currently there's, you can, like, if you watch a movie um, and do kind of more research, there's a lot to hear about or a lot to learn about this. But um, as we're moving more away from um, oil and gas, you know, to, to fuel our transportation and heat our homes and things like that, um, the oil and gas industry is like, well, we have this kind of side hustle, it's called plastic. So let's ramp up our production of that and so that we can still like be in every aspect of everybody's lives. So it's, it's not that we started to rely on it because we needed it. It's just because it started, everything started being in that. And then you run out of options because not everyone has a simply bulk. Um, and we don't even think that way now. So like I always say, you know, medical plastics, sure, all day, you know, if we needed to make a space shuttle, whatever, I don't know what works, but to, you know, shrink wrap a cantaloupe and then put it on a styrofoam tray, we never needed that and we don't anymore. And a lot of the solutions are going back to how we used to do things, which worked fine. You know, if you talk to older generations or even not very old generations, they'll be like, I remember when that wasn't in plastic and that shows that we never needed it for most things. I'd be curious to observe what would happen if um, we just stopped production of all new plastics, recycled what we have remaining, and uh, we would find a way to keep living. They found, you know, life went on before plastic came around, just like Rosie said. And, um, and there are many reasons to continue plastic production right now that are not at the consumer level, um, but that could change if, if change came from above. Great, thank you all. Um, I just wanted to call it a question that was answered in the chat, just in case people watching off Zoom were wondering this. Um, Simply Bulk, uh, would, would you would be interested in taking donations of containers? And Simply Bulk said, if they're clean and sanitized, yes and thanks. So if you have extra containers lying around that you wanna donate and clean, um, Simply Bulk can take those and then other people can use them as well. Uh, we have a question for Rosie and for me. What are some ways people who are interested can get more involved in spreading the good zero waste news with our friends, neighbors, and greater Longmont community? For instance, only 30% of Longmont subscribes to curbside compost collection. Rosie, would you want to start with this or do you want me to go? <laughs> um, so uh, one of the largest things that I do in my job is I run the Eco Leader Network, um, which is how EcoCycle started. It was just a grassroots organization. And so Eco Leaders are basically exactly what that question was, is just people who um, spread the news to their friends, neighbors, whoever they interact with, whatever their networks are. Um, you know, we just want an Eco Leader in every neighborhood and office and school and book club. And it's that person that people know to ask these questions to. Um, so, uh, Naomi did post a link to sign up to be an eco leader. Um, but if it's just every other year you walk around your neighborhood and distribute the recycling guidelines, you're an eco leader. So there's a, a lot of ways to be involved with that and you can email me or sign up. Um, and I always also advocate, um, that in addition to that, being involved with local organizations like SRL, so you can find out how to, um, 
be more organized in approaching council and be involved in legislation and ordinances and things like that. So Naomi can talk about that. Yes, exactly. Sustainable Resilient Longmont does a lot of educational and advocacy work like this webinar and um, going to city council meetings, speaking up on behalf of these issues that we want to see change in and doing outreach. Um, we, you know, use social media right now quite a bit <laughs> because, because it's harder to reach people in person. But uh, if you would like to be in the loop, make sure you know when there's going to be a push for a certain legislation or a similar thing to this webinar, you please join us. I'll have a slide at the end with all of the links, but SRL, uh, srlongmont.org, srlongmont.org is our website and there's sign up there. So um, yeah, we, we try to put on educational campaigns. We have events like the EV fair that uh, is electrical vehicles where we talk about renewable energy. Um, and yeah, we're, we're working towards 100% renewables in 2030 for the city of Longmont. So we have a lot of uh, campaigns about getting out, uh, educating people. And we are right now working on increasing those composting numbers in, in Longmont. And part of that is working with the city council trying to um, expand the current program instead of being opt in, which means you would have to call and go through some phone chains or do it online and say, I want to get composting. If it were instead opt out or universal, it means that everyone would get composting by default and you'd have to say, no, I really, really, really don't want this or universal is just everyone gets it. It's part of our trash services. So that's a big campaign we're going to start advocating for this fall. And if you want to be involved with that, please join uh, our Facebook page. Uh, find us on srlongmont.org. There's a uh, we have, we have uh, Google groups and, and we have, uh, you know, once a month mailings that go out so that you know what, what our current campaigns are. Um, we have another question for Rosie. Um, this might be related, but uh, these two questions might be related. Do you know anything about extended producer responsibility efforts in the US? That's kind of tying into that uh, story of plastics. Uh, information and can you also speak a little bit about the recent SB 20 legislation on recycling and end markets? Yeah, um, so policy is a big thing that we do at EcoCycle. Extend extended producer responsibility or EPR laws are, yeah, exactly what I was just talking about is, you know, the, the metaphor that they use in um, Story of Plastic and what I always say too is when it comes to plastic right now, what we're doing is like our house is flooding and we're bailing ourselves out with a teaspoon because someone turned on the tap full force in our bathtub. And instead of trying to bail ourselves out with a teaspoon, we should just go off, go over and turn off the tap. So that's what we need to do um, with extended, produ extended producer responsibility laws. And in addition to that, um, not only kind of reducing um, the manufacturing, but holding the people who are cranking out that plastic um, responsible for the materials that they're producing, because right now, the recyclers are bearing the financial burden of that. And we don't, recycling wasn't made for plastics and vice versa. So that's not um, a good sustainable solution. So um, there are various EPR um, efforts across the world and across the country. There's not a major one um, in Colorado right now. Uh, it's something that we always, always, always advocate for, but especially when it comes to plastics, plastics is just a big old um, lobbying monster that's really hard to face because it's oil and gas money. Um, so yeah, EPR um, laws are something to do research on for sure. Um, I think a lot of us tend to worry that like I'm causing the plastic crisis if I forget to refuse a straw, um, but working on our own footprints, but also advocating for infrastructural change so that everybody across the board is um, set up for success that's a really important thing to do. So um, like you can, even if there's not a law up um, <laughs> in your uh, legislature, you can always write to your representatives about it. Um, and EcoCycle can keep you up to date on whether one is in existence. Um, and then the current, the most recent law that we, or bill that was passed um, is called SB 20, um, it's called Incentivize Economic Development of Recycling End Market. So our first major recycling related bill um, that we basically ever passed was last year. Um, we're making progress for sure. And that was um, to basically put a little tax on landfills and then that big pot of money can go toward 
um, zero waste programs. Um, so that's called the Front Range Waste Diversion Grant Bill. And this one um, is <laughs> to um, accelerate Colorado's recycling economy by attracting businesses and entrepreneurs to Colorado to use our recyclable materials to make new products. So like what I was talking about with glass is, you know, we need a, a local glass recycled or recycler to come here so we can close the loop on glass. That's what we need for every um, material. So it's basically just how do we get um, markets to be as local as they possibly can, um, especially in the face of stuff like the China, um, Chinese national sword policy. Um, so there's stakeholder process. They, um, they set up guidance for recycling and market development center. Um, and then they direct CDPHE, which is the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment, to conduct a study and then create policy recommendations um, for how product managers can um, play a larger role in designing it with these end markets in mind. Um, so like Devin was saying, you know, that you shouldn't make plastic if it's not recyclable, um, uh, if you have to make it at all. And then um, there's also CDPHE is also required to conduct a statewide campaign to educate Colorado residents about recycling. Um, so that's something that Polis just signed in to law um, on July 13th. So that's a really recent thing. And I think like in a, um, during COVID, there's been a lot of plastic wins, like the plastic industry is getting a lot of breaks. Um, and like Devin said, a lot of our um, environmental feelings and commitments are going out the window. So this was a big win for us to make at this time. There's a lot of people involved. Yay, wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for all your thoughtful answers to the questions. Um, there might still be a couple of questions trickling in through the chat. Um, so feel free to pop on. Does anyone know, is there a group like SRL in Boulder? I don't know the answer to that. I assume there's other, a lot of advocacy groups in Boulder, but I don't know if there's one there's exactly a, like SRL. Um, yeah, not exactly like SRL. There's a bunch of different groups. Um, like you can you can be on the advisory committee for um, for the city, for example. Um, but the eco leaders um, do have a big city of Boulder kind of chapter, not chapter, but group. Um, so if you'd like to be an eco leader, that's hey. not unlike being an SRL. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so we're gonna start to come to a close with our webinar now. Um, Here's a summary list of guidelines to go zero waste. So just a little review of what we talked about today, learning what can be recycled and avoiding non-recyclable packaging when you make shopping decisions. Uh, Making the choice to refuse any excess packaging uh, when you're out and also refusing single use disposables. And so you can replace those single use disposables by carrying reusable travel bugs, silverware and to go containers with you. I keep to go containers in my car at all times, just in case I'm out somewhere and have leftover food I wanna take with me. Um, you can shop at bulk stores and bring your own containers there to refill. And also buying produce at farmer's markets, CSA shopping, and cooking more meals at home. Uh, all of the wonderful repurposing ideas that Jenny shared, jars, plastic containers can be storage and organizational solutions upcycling old clothes into those bags, those trash liners, rugs, home decor, and reusing those old newspapers for compost bin liners. So many wonderful ideas I'm gonna take with me from this webinar. And most importantly, before you toss it, just look at it and say, can this have another use? And get creative with that. Um, so finally, we decided to organize this zero waste webinar this month as part of Plastic Free July, which is a global movement to reduce plastic waste. And as we mentioned earlier, um, in conjunction with Plastic Free July, SRL is hosting a free online screening of the story of plastic, a documentary about our man-made crisis of plastic pollution and the worldwide effect it has on the health of our planet and the people who inhabit it. So the link to the screening will be in the Zoom chat and on our Facebook page and is also on our website, but our screening copy expires on August 3rd. So I encourage you to check it out soon if you haven't already. Um, I think there's still like 40 some uh, views left. So you're, uh, you just click on the link and I streamed it the other night and it was incredibly eye-opening and informative. I really encourage you to check it out if you haven't. Uh, the film ends by detailing what we need to advocate for on a corporate 
political and global level, some of that stuff that Rosie was just talking about at the end. Um, so the website storyofplastic.org has ways you can take action on these higher levels and um, join the break free from plastic movement. We'll also link, link to that EcoCycle recording of a post-screening discussion they did on the film. So that's, uh, if you want to hear more discussion on this topic, uh, it's another wonderful uh, recording that they provided. And that's about it for our July Zero Waste webinar. If you would like to get involved with Sustainable Resilient Longmont and the Zero Waste Committee, there will be links in the Zoom chat and all the links we shared in today's webinar will be posted with the full video on our website and our YouTube channel and as well as on the Facebook Live video page. We are a community run nonprofit and rely on donations and grants. So if you're able to donate, we deeply appreciate your support. Thank you everyone who joined us for this webinar and a huge thank you to our panelists, Rosie, Jenny, and Devin for all the information and expertise you shared with us today. Take care everyone, wash your hands, wear a mask and stay safe. Bye. Thank you.